This episode was originally published in August 2022. Since then, October 7 has passed, meaning it has now been 30 years since Rihanna Barrow's disappearance. Since publishing the episode, SA Police have also been able to comment on the case. The following is a statement made on October 14, 2022 from police spokesperson Detective Superintendent Des Bray, who is the officer in charge of the Major Crime Investigation Branch. It is 30 years since 12-year-old Rihanna Barrow disappeared from her home address on Wakefield Avenue in Morford Vale. She was at home alone on 7th of October 1992 during the school holidays, when she disappeared after she walked to the nearby Southgate shopping centre at Ranella to buy a Christmas card for a pen pal. The presence of the card and receipt at the home, along with sightings en route, led investigators to believe she made it safely home from the shops. However, some time after that, the responsible young girl simply vanished from the property. Detective Superintendent Des Bray, the officer in charge of the Major Crime Investigation Branch, said that the case is one of the largest files with the major crime in modern times. Quote, There has been a regular flow of information to police over the last 30 years about this case, with thousands of individual actions undertaken by police and more than 250 reports to Crime Stoppers, he said. The nature of this crime and of Rihanna would tend to suggest that she knew her abductor or had no reason to be fearful and that they have told no one since. That makes our job much harder. It is tragic that 30 years have passed without Rihanna's family having any answers, but police will continue to seek opportunities to further the investigation and re-examine the forensic evidence. There is a $1 million reward for information on this case, either leading to the recovery of Rihanna or for information leading to the conviction of the persons responsible for her disappearance and presumed murder. Anyone with information is urged to call Crime Stoppers on 1-800-333-000 or report online at www.crimestoppersa.com.au. Before we get into the episode, I just wanted to thank everybody who reached out to get in touch about Rihanna. It's clear that her disappearance sent shockwaves around the community, with its impact still being felt by her friends, classmates, teachers, and family till this day. I also wanted to thank the various authorities and researchers who were able to give up their time to shed a little more light on missing person statistics and data in South Australia. If you or someone you know has information related to this case, please call Crime Stoppers on 1-800-333-000. This episode has information and described circumstances that some listeners may find distressing. For support, contact your local crisis centre. If you're in Australia, services such as Lifeline can be reached 24 hours a day at 131114. That's 13 11 14. The Christmas card in the newsagent's bag was sitting in the centre of the dining room table here and um, that's basically the last we've heard of her. I mean, she was an innocent 12-year-old girl. Um, we've seen her walking down the street and that at times with her friends, with her mother. She was just an average 12-year-old girl. Please come forward. I just want my daughter back. It's not the same at home. The year is 1992. Cartoon Cable Network, as it was then known, premiered and the first test flight of an Airbus A330 takes place. In 1992, Australia's population was hovering around 17 million. Paul Keating, member of the Labour Party, was our Prime Minister. In February of that year, Noosa in Queensland experienced the worst flooding since 1968 and declared a state of emergency. In May, Lindy Chamberlain received compensation for wrongful conviction on murder charges. But our story, the story of missing teenager Rihanna Barreau, takes place on October 7 in a southern suburb of Adelaide called Morfitt Vale. Morfitt Vale is in the city of Onkaparinga, 
As of 2022, it is the largest suburb in the state of South Australia, with a population of 23,000. It was the first major town in the southern suburbs, and by 1866, it was reported to have a large number of neat residences and fine vineyards. By the 1960s, a large number of overseas immigrants made their way to Adelaide, and by then, land had extensively been subdivided which transformed the area from rural to metropolitan. Morford Vale would become home to a large number of British and Irish expats, who chose the sunny lifestyle of Australia to raise a family. Growing up, families would form tight-knit neighbourhood communities, with some small cul-de-sac streets being home to the same families even until today. Adelaide's population in 1992 was approximately 1,098,000. A mix of low to middle income families, Morford Vale was close to the beach and sandwiched between the water in the west and the Adelaide Hills in the east. During school holidays, it wasn't uncommon to see children playing in the quiet cul-de-sacs or walking up and down main thoroughfares to shopping centres. You grew up in the neighbourhood where you went to school. Your friends would live around the corner and you'd come home for lunch only to head back out again. It was, by all accounts, a relatively safe neighbourhood where people went on with their lives. 12-year-old Rihanna Barrow lived at home with her brother and mother in a three-bedroom home at number 47 Wakefield Avenue. She attended the local Ranella South Primary School and had a close group of friends. Wakefield Avenue was a quiet cul-de-sac with only one direction south as the exit onto other roads. Large gum trees line the streets and an open park sits opposite number 47. October 7, 1992 was a Wednesday in the week following the October 5 Labor Day long weekend. It was term three school holidays and Rihanna was enjoying her time off, spending time at home. It was almost the middle of spring, heading into summer. On the morning of October 7, her mother, Paula Barrow, getting ready to leave for work, entered Rihanna's bedroom where she found her listening to Love Shack by the B-52s. Earlier that morning, Miss Barrow heard on the radio that there was going to be a snap bus strike. The pair had planned to meet at Colonnade's shopping centre, but due to the bus strike, there would be no way for Rihanna to get to the shopping centre other than walking the hour-long walk along main roads. Rihanna, who wanted to purchase a Christmas card for her overseas pen pal, needed to go to a news agency. So, rather than walking to Colonnades, the pair decided it would be better if Rihanna made the approximate 20-minute walk to the local Ranella shopping centre instead. Paula Barrow left the house at approximately 8.30am to drive to TAFE, a type of technical college, which was about a 10-minute drive from the family's home. Her brother was away at the time, and therefore Rihanna was home alone, which was not unusual at the time. Approximately two hours later, at about 10.30am, Rihanna left her home on 47 Wakefield Avenue and walked approximately 1.2 kilometers to Ranella Shopping Center, now called Southgate Square. It's there she purchased a Christmas card at 11.19am for her pen pal. If you visit the show notes, there is a link to a map to help you visualize her route. To return home, Rihanna could have walked via Acre Road and onto High Ray Drive, or via Sheriff's Road and used Morford Vale High School and Stanvac Primary School to cut her walk time by a few minutes. Sheriff's Road, which borders the suburb of Morford Vale in the north, is a main arterial road that runs east to west linking Old Ranella and Woodcroft in the east to Lonsdale, the industrial area, in the west. Due to confirmed sightings, we can theorise she walked approximately 650 metres west via Sheriff's Road, then made her way south using Morfitt Vale High School and Stanvac Primary School grounds ending up on High Ray Drive. Between 12.05 and 12.30pm, there were confirmed sightings of Rihanna crossing the school grounds carrying a small bag, presumably containing the Christmas card she had just purchased from the news agency. After the 12.30pm sighting of Rihanna on Highway Drive, she was never seen alive again.
Brianna's mum, Paula, arrived home at approximately 4.10pm to find the door locked, the television on, and a vinyl record on the living room floor. Crucially, she'd found an unopened Christmas card on the dining room table. Thinking Rihanna was home, Paula looked for her in the house, but she was nowhere to be found. Worried, she'd called Rihanna's friends and knocked on neighbors' doors, and by 6pm, she'd filed a missing persons report with the police. Rihanna's description at the time she went missing is as follows, 158 centimeters or 5 foot 2, 44 kilos, a slim build, hazel eyes, a fair complexion, light brown to blonde hair below shoulder length. She was wearing purple shorts and a green t-shirt with the words hypercolor across the front, a common style of clothing for the late 80s and early 90s. She had white socks and white link sneakers with bright pink tongues. After initial investigations by police, they had found no signs of breaking and entering. There were no signs of a struggle and no personal items of Rihanna's were missing except for her house keys and a golden heart-shaped locket she is thought to have been wearing at the time of her disappearance. By all accounts, the house was left in an orderly manner. There were no fingerprints, there was no blood, not a single piece of physical evidence. Upon canvassing the neighborhood, the police had also discovered there was an absence of any neighborhood disturbance. There were no screams, no shouting, no tire screeching. There was no evidence on the footpath, on the road, in the park, in the schools, on the streets. Nothing. There were searches of rubbish dumps and bushland around the Onka Paringa Reserve. One tip-off to the police claimed she was being held hostage in an apartment block on Anzac Highway in Coralta Park. After a police raid, they had found no sign of her. No one saw nothing, no one heard nothing. The fact is, people don't simply vanish into thin air, and as one of my favourite true crime podcasts puts it simply, someone knows something. Stranger abductions of children are extremely rare. According to the National Missing Persons Centre, a very small percentage of missing persons cases in Australia are stranger abductions. Young people, those under the age of 18, go missing for a number of reasons, including family and social conflict, wanting to become independent, being the victim of crime, forgetting to communicate, mental health problems, drugs or alcohol abuse, as well as escaping from other abuse and neglect. Most young people who are reported missing disappear for short periods of time before either being located or returning home themselves. Unfortunately, in this particular case, no trace of Rihanna has ever been found. Although cases like the Beaumont children, who disappeared from Glenelg on Australia Day in 1966, as well as Joanne Ratcliffe and Kirsty Gordon, who disappeared from the Adelaide Oval in 1973, were most likely at the forefront of people's minds in 1992, the fact is, both stranger abductions and stranger homicides are rare. According to data published by the Australian Institute of Criminology, there were 30 homicides in South Australia between 1992 and 1993. Australia-wide, there were a total of 313 incidents of homicide. 104 of them were domestic incidents, and 125 of them were those by an acquaintance. Just 29 out of 313 were classified as homicides committed by a stranger. 55 incidents are not classified. If police were called to a homicide, they were much more likely to be looking for a perpetrator known to the victim either by a family, friend, or acquaintance. In Rihanna Barrow's case, the fact that there was no disturbance at the home suggests a few things. The strongest theory, according to Belise, as well as her mum when she was interviewed in 2015, is that she was most likely lured outside her house by someone she knew. The other theory, which is not supported by any evidence, is that she left the house of her own accord and was snatched at another location. The reason the second theory doesn't really stand up is the fact that no one saw her walking down either Wakefield or Acre. No one heard anything, or no one saw anything. After the 12.30pm sighting of Rihanna, we know she made it home due to the fact that the Christmas card she had purchased from the shops was on the dining room table. 
by 4.10 p.m., Rihanna's mum had made it home from TAFE. Therefore, in the 220 unaccounted for minutes, Rihanna had disappeared. There are a few things that most likely helped police to narrow down their theories. The first thing is that it was school holidays. Students who attended the two local schools and other schools around the Moffat Vale area were more than likely home between 12.30pm and 4.10pm. Wednesday, October 7, was also a relatively pleasant day temperature-wise. The day peaked around 23.7 degrees Celsius, meaning kids were likely playing in their backyards, front yards, walking to the local deli, shopping center, and visiting their friends' houses. The fact that no one heard or saw anything suggests she most likely disappeared from her home rather than at another location. However, if you search discussion forums, there are multiple threads regarding Rihanna's disappearance, you'll find there is some confusion regarding Rihanna's last confirmed sighting. If you view the map once more, police investigated reports that placed her at the junction of Acre Avenue and David Terrace around 4pm. According to police, they spent a lot of time establishing whether it was Rihanna. Ultimately though, they came to the conclusion that the reports were most likely unassociated with her which is why Crime Stoppers and media reports put her last confirmed sighting at approximately 12.30 p.m. The most likely reason they ruled out those reports is the distance from her home at 47 Wakefield Avenue and the very public location. Looking at the map, I've dotted two routes she'd most likely take if she in fact walked to the junction of Acre Avenue and David Terrace. Firstly, she'd have to walk approximately 600 or so meters and pass 20 to 30 houses, all with either no fencing in their front yards or very low fences. Most residential building codes in South Australia require functional spaces like living rooms to have windows that look onto the street. Therefore, if one was sitting on the couch or in the dining room between the hours of 12.30pm and 4pm, the curtains were open, you'd be able to notice someone walking past. Furthermore, Acre Avenue is a main thoroughfare that connects Sheriff's Road in the north and O'Sullivan's Beach Road in the south, and most smaller roads in the suburb connect to Acre Avenue, meaning there would have been, or at least should have been, cars travelling north-south. The fact that not a single person saw her walking along Wakefield Avenue or any of the other roads leading to Acre Avenue suggests the reports placing her on the corner of David and Acre were most likely not of Rihanna. Rihanna's case is now treated as a murder homicide. When speaking to the advertiser in 2010, Detective Senior Sergeant Steve Kinsman from the Major Crime Investigation Branch said Rihanna's missing persons case would remain open until someone was convicted of her abduction and murder. At the time of Rihanna's disappearance, police were investigating a hold in Tirana with Victorian registration plates. In 2017, speaking to the advertiser, Major Crime Case Officer Sergeant Simon May said every aspect of the file was under review. According to Crime Stoppers, there is no definitive suspect in Rihanna's case. However, police have several persons of interest they believe have information concerning her disappearance. In another interview with the media, now retired Detective Alan Arthur said, quote, she didn't have a boyfriend, would not have run away, so the more we learned of her family history, I was convinced that she had met a terrible fate. He then goes on to say that he still believes the perpetrator lived or lives closer to her home address than perhaps further out, and that, quote, until someone who knows what happened and there always is someone comes forward, then I think this will remain unsolved.
One of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast was to coincide with National Missing Persons Week, which runs from the last week of July to the first week of August. In 2020, there were more than 51,000 missing persons reports made to police in Australia, which is more than 140 on every day of the year. Any person missing for more than three months is classified as a long-term missing person. There are approximately 2,600 long-term missing persons in Australia. According to missingpersons.gov.au, there are a variety of circumstances under which children and young people go missing. Children and young people most commonly went missing from or were last seen when reported missing to police at their own home 60% of the time. 22% of the time, they were either seen at school or travelling to or from school. 4% were seen at commercial or entertainment areas or a similar public place. 4% is a non-specific location, such as out with friends, walking or on holiday. According to the report, Friday tended to be the most common day of the week that children and young people go missing, although distribution across the other days of the week was relatively flat, 9-18% to of the time. Time of day, where specified, also varied, but was most commonly during the morning and afternoon hours. The most common time of day for people to go missing is between 6 and 11 a.m. 24% of the time it is between noon and 5 p.m. and 20% of the time it is between 6 and 11 p.m. Other data includes daytime, non-specific, and nighttime, non-specific. Most missing people are reported the same day or the next day, with only 14% reported between 2 and 3 days and 10% reported between four and seven days. It is a very common myth often perpetuated by media and films that you have to wait 24 hours until you can report someone missing. That is 100% false. Anytime you have concern for the safety or welfare of a person, you can contact the police and report them as missing. As the study further highlighted, the majority of children and young people who go missing under circumstances that are not crime-related, it is important to treat each incident as if it could be crime-related for a number of reasons. Firstly, overseas experience confirms that the initial hours are critical when a child goes missing. A United States analysis of child abduction murders, published in 1997, concluded that the vast majority of these children are murdered within three hours of abduction. Immediate reporting by parents and immediate action by police is critical in such cases, and was critical in Rihanna's disappearance. If you have any information about Rihanna Burrow's disappearance, I urge you to contact Crime Stoppers on 1-800-333-000. Crime Stoppers South Australia is an independent community organisation and registered charity that works with the police, government, media, corporate partners and the community, and their aim is to help solve and reduce crime. Since 1996, information provided by the community to Crime Stoppers has directly helped to solve more than 34,000 crimes. Crime Stoppers is not a department of South Australia Police, but they do work closely and pass your information on to them for investigation. After you have provided Crime Stoppers with information about unsolved crimes or suspicious activities, it is reviewed by specially trained Crime Stoppers operators to make sure that nothing can identify you if you have chosen to remain anonymous. Your information is then passed to the relevant section within South Australia Police for action. Your contact with Crime Stoppers is not taped, traced or identified in any way. A reward of up to $1 million remains on offer to anyone who either provides information leading to the recovery of her remains or information leading to a conviction in the case.